Uh, good morning and welcome to the 12th meeting of the committee in 2015. Uh, if you wish to use tablets or mobile phones during the meeting, please switch them to the flight mode as they may otherwise affect the broadcasting system. Some committee members may consult tablets during the course of the meeting. This is because we provide meeting papers in a digital format. Uh, we've received apologies this morning from Alec Rowley. Uh, agenda item one is to agree to take agenda item four in private. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Uh, agenda item two is consideration of petition PE01534. This is by Claire Simmons on behalf of Planning Democracy on Equal Rights of Appeal in the Planning System. The petition was lodged with the Parliament on the 3rd of September 2014 and has been referred to us by the Public Petitions Committee. The petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to review the current rights of appeal within planning uh, and other consenting processes which give deemed planning consent considering the benefits of widening the scope of appeal and providing an equal right of appeal. Uh, we have a paper from the clerk setting out the background to the petition and the written, written and oral evidence to the Public Petitions Committee received on this petition before they referred it to us. Uh, do any members have a view on the pet petition? Um, uh, Ms Hilton. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, see, I've got quite a lot of sympathy with the petition. Um, I think it is something that does need to be explored further because it does look at the moment that there is a bit of an imbalance in the system you know um, and I do think local communities and um, local people are losing out to some extent so I think it is something we should look at if we can progress it somehow. Any other members? Miss Adamson? Um, at this stage um, because it's very early in terms of when the new regulations have come in that we write to the government and ask them what the time scale is for reviewing the planning you. Can I suggest that we write to the government and ask uh, about the petition and ask them what their plans are uh, to, to review? Um, uh, we wait for the response back from the government, uh, and if we don't feel that that response is the right one, then we should ask the Cabinet Secretary um, to appear in front of the committee. Would that uh, satisfy members? Okay, agreed. Thank you. Uh, in which case now we move on to um, uh, agenda item three, uh, which is an oral evidence session with the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland, Bill Thompson. Uh, Bill is joined in the panel by Helen Hayne, Investigations Manager at the Commissioner's Office, uh, and I welcome you both here today. Uh, before we move on to questions, do you have any opening remarks? Mr Thompson. Thank you, Convener. Um, with your indulgence, I would just like to say a few words. First of all, to thank you for the opportunity to come and speak to you about the annual report uh, for the year to 2030, sorry, 31st of March 2014, uh, and also for giving me a little bit of time to settle into the post before doing so. Uh, that is appreciated. Um, and as you've just heard, I'm accompanied by Mrs. Helen Hayne whose role as Investigations Manager includes responsibility for our case management system. Uh, in addition to being fully up to speed with our current cases, Helen offers a significant degree of continuity, having worked uh, in the role for a number of years, uh, in addition to a detailed knowledge of the internal aspects of our investigative processes. So I hope that between us we'll be able to answer any questions that you may have. And in anticipation that you would be as interested in what has happened since the 31st of March 2014 as in the details covered by the annual report, I have submitted updates to some of the tables and I believe these will have been circulated to you. The information has been supplied as at the 18th of March. It may therefore be subject to some revision before it is published in the next annual report in a few months' time. Uh, and if I can just run through that information briefly, Table 2 shows the total number of complaints received and the breakdown against councillors, members of public bodies uh, and those which did not come within my jurisdiction to investigate. You will see, perhaps, that these figures have been somewhat distorted 
by a large number of related complaints which have been dealt with as a single case. Uh, and what I suggest is that it might be more helpful for comparative purposes to look at the final row in the table which shows the number of cases considered. There's a further breakdown of complaints in Table 3, uh, and I imagine you may well have some questions on that. Um, table 4 details the number of complaints received from members of the public, which is the vast bulk of complaints, uh, or from councillors. Uh, and you will see that there are also very much smaller numbers of complaints which we receive from officers of a local authority from MSPs or, in a few cases, uh, are submitted anonymously. I would like to draw your attention to Table 6, which gives comparative figures for the numbers of complaints progressed during the year. Because there was a spike, at least I hope it was a spike, uh, in the numbers of complaints received during 2013-14, to 14, there were still 76 complaints outstanding at the end of that year. And I'm pleased to be able to report that despite receiving a significant number in the course of this year, even allowing for the 254 which were dealt with as a single case, we appear to be heading towards having a smaller number outstanding at the year end. But that figure will have to be adjusted uh, to take account of what has happened between the 18th and the 31st of March. Um, I would just like to say I've been very impressed by the steady and continuing effort of all the staff involved in progressing these cases over the course of the year. Finally, uh, Table 7 lists the outcome in terms of my findings. Uh, and as you know, my word is not final, as all breach cases involving councillors or members of public bodies are reported to the Standards Commission, who generally arrange a public hearing, at the end of which they may or may not agree that there's been a breach of the code. And in the course of the year, and because of the volume of complaints received during the previous year and in this year, uh, there have been more public hearings than in previous years. So far, eight have been concluded. One of these involved two councillors, and one hearing has been continued until later this month. In summary, uh, that is the current state of play in respect of that part of my work which falls within the remit of this committee, uh, and I, we are happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Mr Thompson. In terms of the... Uh, 524 complaints that relate to one issue. Um, I've got an inkling of what that would be, but could you tell the committee what that uh, that actual case is, please? Yes, Convener. Um, it is a complaint by a, a number of members of the public, um, 85, I think, um, about actions taken by a number of councillors in the political administration in the city of Aberdeen. Um, the, I reported to the Standards Commission that there had been a breach of the code. The Standards Commission set a hearing which started in February and was adjourned and is resuming on the 15th and 16th of this month. Um, but for reasons that I'm sure you'll understand, I can't really go into the detail of the issue. Um, I wouldn't ask you to go into the detail because I realise that's a, a, a live situation and uh, I would say to members that in terms of our questioning we have to be careful and, uh, and take cognizance of, of those cases that are live. Um, in terms of, of the, the spike that there has been in 2014-15, it seems that a, a large amount of that is due to this one case. Is that correct? Um, that accounts for the bulk of the numbers in 2014-15, but the spike to which I was referring in my introductory remarks um, is actually in the previous year, the year covered by the annual report. Um, Which is 298 up from 181 the previous year. I think there were 311 in... Thompson. Oh, sorry, 311. Yeah. I'm only looking at the councillors. I yeah. beg your pardon, Ms. Uh, Mr Thompson. Um, which... Uh, even if you look at the number of cases, and I'm sorry this is potentially confusing, um, the number of cases is effectively the number of separate issues that we have progressed. Um, and in very simplistic terms, and I realise this is not mathematically correct, between 2011-12 and the following year, there was roughly a 10% increase. I think it's actually 7, but roughly 
10% uh, increase in the number of cases. And then in the following year, there was a further 20% increase. Um, that was into 2013-14. Um, this year, we look to be heading back to the sort of levels uh, we experienced in 2011-2012. So I'm, that's why I say I hope there was a spike and that we're heading back to a slightly lower level. Thank you very much. Um, in terms of uh, his appearance before the committee the last time, um, Mr Allen was questioned uh, about alios and complaints uh, about uh, those folks who sit on those outside bodies and obviously councillors are covered by the code when they sit in alios but uh, non-councillors external members of that alio are not um, and the committee felt that that was a little bit of an, an an anomaly, uh, anomaly even, uh, a word I can never say. Um, could you tell us if, uh, if anything has been done to, to try and, and bridge that anomaly? The short answer is yes, uh, although I'm not sure that it will appear uh, very much in published documents. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, the code of conduct for councillors does endeavour to cover the situation where councillors are appointed to other bodies, uh, at least in terms of the specific rules on registration and declaration of interests. Um, and it does give guidance. Um, the Standards Commission, uh, who conduct a certain amount of outreach, uh, I know are aware of this issue of um, Alios Arms Length Organisations um, originally set up by councils um, and have been involved in some discussions, including uh, specifically with uh, one authority who, who asked them to come and address the particular issue. Um, I know it was also discussed uh, at a recent meeting involving members of the Standards Commission and monitoring officers from uh, a fairly substantial number of authorities across the country. Uh, so it is a live issue. My impression is that although there may be concerns in some uh, council areas, there don't seem to be concerns in other council areas. And I'm sorry, I don't have enough information to be able to explain mm -hmm. why that is. Um, one thing that it may be related is the question of integration joint boards, which as you know, uh, have to be in place from today, actually, um, in terms of health and social care. Um, and um, I had the opportunity to ask one of the government solicitors last week uh, whether any consideration had been given to the position on those joint boards which have councillors on them as well as representatives of health boards. Um, and my understanding is that the government, if they have not already done so, uh, intend to add integration joint boards to the list of bodies covered by the Ethical Standards Act 2000 under which uh, I conduct these investigations, which would mean that they will have to have, by the time they come fully into operation in a year's time, they will have to have their own codes of conduct. Um, and that, I think, uh, solves one problem in that all the members of the integration joint board will be covered by the same code of conduct. It does, of course, leave open the issue that councillors will be covered separately by the councillors' code. So I'm hoping that in the way that these new codes are drawn up, uh, there won't be any um, what a former presiding officer used to call accordities between the two codes. Um, that's very interesting. Uh, I just wonder, even though there has not been... Uh, many complaints uh, about uh, outside non-councillor members of, uh, of Alios. Do you think it would be wise to extend your regime to, to cover these folks too, uh, just in case there were a, a spate or a spike of complaints uh, about these folks? That's a difficult question to answer, Convener. Uh, I'm not trying to be evasive. Um, one thought I have is that if there does not appear to be a problem at the moment, then uh, there would be little point in trying to fix it. On the other hand, I can 
appreciate that there may not be a problem at the moment because there is no code for these people to breach. Um, I have had, in the year I've been in post, very few complaints which relate to the behaviour of anybody on Alios. Um, so it certainly appears to me on the evidence available that it's not a particular problem. Um, my suspicion is that it is more likely to become a problem, particularly in terms of conflict of interest, uh, as the resources available to councils and therefore to bodies funded by them are further constrained, because that may well bring councillors into a position where they have um, a problematic conflict of interest. Thank you. John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Mr Thompson. Good morning, Ms Hayne. Just to go back to the issue raised by the Convener in terms of Alios, now I, you try to, I think, assure us that things were working well in terms of values and you hadn't received that many complaints. But can I uh, recall a story I heard uh, last week where one local authority uh, committee had to take a vote three times because they were unsure whether committee members, councillors sitting in the committee could actually participate in a vote uh, because they were members of uh, various boards and alios that were established by the local authority. Uh, and it took, the, on the third attempt, they think they got it right in terms of who should be participating and who should not be participating. If council officials and councillors are unaware of whether or not they can participate in the decision-making structures of the local authority when it comes to alios, how assured are you that there aren't mistakes being made through local authorities in Scotland that have values, because not every local authority has values in place. Because my concern is if council officials are unaware and councillors are unaware that they're not, they're breaching uh, the code of conduct, then how do we know uh, that these breaches aren't taking place on a daily basis? Mr. Um, Convener, uh, Mr. Wilson, I don't know. It's as simple as that. Um, I'm not presuming or assuming, uh, but the answer I gave to the previous question um, included a reference to the problems which may occur with conflicts of interest, which is precisely, I think, the issue which troubled the local authority to which you're referring. Um, I think the code is actually quite complex in terms of registration and declaration of interests and it's particularly complex for councillors who are involved in other bodies. And the issue does not just arise uh, in relation to alios, by the way. It, it has arisen uh, even in hearings, in situations where councillors are involved in different sorts of bodies, sometimes bodies which are not actually set up by the local authority itself. So the whole business of uh, registration and declaration is possibly the most complex uh, and difficult part of the code. Um, so I, assuming that the situation which you describe um, is accurate, uh, it, it may not be completely unusual. Um, but I, I don't go looking for trouble. Um, I will only deal with complaints which come to me. So uh, I'm not in a position to say, despite having had discussions with monitoring officers recently, uh, that there are problems in other parts of the country, but there may well be. I understand you don't go looking for trouble, but uh, when trouble does come to you, then it's trying to assure everybody concerned, including the public, that the standards are being applied across the board. And if you're saying, in your words, own words, where the code is complex, then has there been any discussion about simplifying the codes so that not only officials, council officials, elected members, but the public understand what is uh, expected of local authorities, especially elected members, when it comes to being making decisions on behalf of local authorities while sitting as members of economic development forums, uh, ALIOs and various other public bodies that may derive income from the local authority itself. I think that's a fair point. I'm not aware of any such discussions. 
thank you. Would you undertake to go and have some discussions with this, particularly the Standards uh, Commission uh, to look at the issue? Because I think it is a concern that you, you've said that you don't go looking for complaints. But as I said, my fear is that people, if they are making complaints, may be complaining to the same council officials who do not understand the code and therefore cannot advise uh, the public whether or not there is grounds for a complaint to be made or other elected members. I'm happy to take it up with the Standards Commission, give you that undertaking. And as I think I've already mentioned, I know they're aware of the issue. Um, I, I would be deeply concerned if local government officials weren't clear on the code, but um, that's right. As I said, the, 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 my earlier example was where three, three times they attempted to take a vote uh, and, the, the, and officials were present at that vote and couldn't advise the members whether or not they were taking the vote correctly and whether or not members could participate in that. But that aside, just in, to, in relation to the number of complaints, total number, going back to the 2013-14 report, number of complaints received and the number of complaints dealt with as cases. It's basically in Table 7, uh, you've indicated 291 total number of complaints and 146. That's less than half of the... Or, uh, Roughly less than half of the complaints received are actually then progressed as, and dealt with as cases. Is there a reason for that? I, I, th I think I need to explain that a bit better. Um, convener, if I could take the committee back to table two. Um, I, I'm not avoiding the issue. This is an attempt to explain it. Um, there are footnotes, um, one with an asterisk and one with two asterisks, under table two. Um, the procedure which we operate means that each individual complaint against each individual councillor is treated as a single complaint. Um, you asked convener about the um, 254 cases, uh, sorry, complaints which are being dealt with as a single case. Uh, that's uh, 524, I'm sorry, <laughs> numbers right. are going around in my head. Um, that's the prime example uh, of the difference between complaints and cases. Um, and it's why I was suggesting, um, for comparison purposes, it's probably better to look at the number of cases. Um, and what Table 7 indicates um, is two separate things. Um, the total number of complaints was 291. They were all dealt with. Um, but because of this multiplication exercise, uh, when you undo that, the total number of cases uh, was only 146. Um, so I'm sorry that's not been wholly clear. It, no, I'm raising the question because it just looks, when you look at Table 7, it looks as though there's a, a glaring, you know, uh, less than 50% of the, the complaints are being progressed. It may be, may be in terms of the reporting mechanism, that's, and I know you've referred us to Table 2, had made that distinction, but it's whether or not you know, somebody scanning through the annual report looks at the annual report and says, oh, by the way, you know, there's almost 300 complaints made and less than 150 complaints are dealt with. Uh, and it's just trying to uh, get clarification on the record in uh, relation to that. Uh, Kavira, I'm aware of that confusion. Um, I'm trying to find the best way to resolve it. But if I can go back to Table 7, um, Actually, the position is more stark than Mr. Wilson is um, suggesting to me because the, if you look at the 2013-14 figures, um, 200 of the 291 complaints did not proceed beyond initial investigation. Um, so that's two-thirds, obviously. Um, and that is because... Um, well, I wasn't there at the time, but that's because my predecessor and the office uh, reached the view... Uh, that they could not be a breach of the code. Uh, and that tends to be the pattern. Uh, we receive many more complaints than those in which we find breaches, um, which, uh, on one view, is good news. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, just finally, uh, Convener, just a question. I know the, there's a crossover between ethical standards and the Standards Commission in relation to... Uh, code of conduct uh, but one of the issues that I've raised in the past is the issue regarding the registers of interest and how up to date 
uh, elected members registered of interest are. And I know that in this place, and Mr Thompson will be well aware of the procedures within the Parliament in trying to ensure that elected members uh, keep their registers as up to date as possible. But in some cases, I've heard that uh, some of the local authority registers for elected members I are well out of date and are very seldom updated. And when elected members do try to update the registers, it can take several months before the, any update uh, and any registrations that they wish to uh, see being made appear on the council websites. Mr. Thompson. Thank you. I, I don't have a composite picture of the whole country, but um, I'm certainly aware that that has been a problem in some areas. Um, there is actually a statutory instrument um, uh, from 2003 which sets up the rules about registers of interest for councillors and it does require councillors to update them within a month of any change which is the same position as for uh, members of the Scottish Parliament um, but I'm not sure how widely that is appreciated um, the guidance issued by the Standards Commission refers separately to um, annual reviews and six monthly reminders to councillors um, I'm not convinced that that is adequate Thank you. Um, before I take in Claire Adamson, um, you've talked of, of monitoring officers. How many of the complaints that you have received have actually come from monitoring officers? A handful is the answer, convener. Um, the, the tables do record the numbers received from council officials. Um, they tend actually to come from the chief executive, but they tend to be put together by the chief executive working with the monitoring officer. So it has been two or three a year for some time now. So not a substantial amount at all, that would be fair to say. Um, I heard it described um, by one of the monitoring officers at the meeting I referred to, um, which took place last week, uh, as the nuclear option. Uh, I think it's a very much a last resort for council officials to make a complaint to, uh, to me. But a nuclear option that's not taken very often, could that be because um, there's maybe a little bit of fear um, among certain officials about taking that nuclear option as you describe it? I don't know is the answer, but I, it's self-evident that if you have a role in which you uh, have to work with elected officials, uh, elected members for... Um, the period of the between elections um, reporting to the standards commissioner is not something you would resort to very readily um, I'm sure most senior officials I've been one myself um, would seek to deal with things um, by agreement or at least behind closed doors rather than reporting and the risk of it uh, coming to a public hearing so is there maybe an argument for taking monitoring officers out of the norm of the council um, executive set up and maybe creating independent monitoring officers to take overviews in councils rather than it normally being the case the, the person in charge of legal? I'm not sure I would um, immediately support that suggestion. Um, I'm not sure you're actually asking me to. Um, my own experience is that it's better if things are handled uh, by the people who are there. Um, and therefore, I think it would put a chief executive in a very odd position if there was an independent monitoring officer um, who could and I realise this is a value judgment who could interfere uh, with however a difficult situation was being dealt with. Um, I don't imagine local authority officials would welcome that. Uh, as per usual, I'm playing devil's advocate, Mr Thompson. Uh, Ms Adamson, please. Yeah. Um, uh, good morning. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the, the public perception of how the complaint system operates. And um, in, in the go back to the position of alios. Um, as most alios are set up as charities, I wondered if the public would go to the Charities Commissioner to make complaints rather than to the Standards Commission. I wonder 
wondered whether you had any interaction at all with the charities commissioners about complaints to them that may involve um, councillors sitting on alios. I have not had any such interaction. Um, I confess it had not occurred to me until you asked the question, but it's maybe a good idea for me to do so. Okay. Um, the, the second question I have is actually about the, the publication of the complaints process um, when a complaint is made against a councillor. And my understanding is that um, as soon as the complaint made, it goes on, the it's published on the website, is that correct, to say that there has been a complaint? No? Or is it only after investigation? Um, I'll ask Helen to answer that. Uh, no, that's not the process. The process during our investigation is to um, receive the complaint, inform the respondent as soon as possible that we've got the complaint to give them an opportunity to respond. It's not until the decision is made by the commissioner that it goes on the website. Okay. And if there's a decision to take no further action, is, is that still published on the website? We would publish all decisions that the commissioner thought was in the public interest. So if it was trivial and not of public interest, then it wouldn't go on the website. Anything of substance that would be of interest to the public, we would uh, we would put on the. It was. It was just website. I wanted to clarify that point because I know that when you sometimes if you search for a particular councillor's names, the first thing that comes up is the standards commission, and very often it's a, a no further action result, as you've shown from your statistics. And I just wondered if that maybe gave the perception to the public that there have been significant complaints against particular councillors or you had a concern in that area about how it's published? Mm. Uh, I, I think if I would rather answer that, I think <laughs> it's <don't laughs> fair to ask uh, Helen to answer that. Um, that's a possible perception. Um, I would, however, suggest that if, even if there were multiple complaints against a particular councillor, uh, and if none of them was found to have amounted to a breach of the code, um, I don't see that that could reasonably be portrayed uh, as that, you know, a slur on that councillor's character. Um, not all the complaints we receive are politically motivated, but some of them are. Um, and it would appear that there are some councillors who are more prone to such <laughs> complaints than others. I'll, I'll leave it at that. I think I'll leave it there just well. Thank you. Convener, thank you. Will I coffee, please? Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, good morning, Bill. Uh, I wonder if I could risk asking you a question on Table 7 again, please, on the, the extra sheet that you you gave us. Um, do you see the number there, 540 outcomes which are deemed to be breach? Do they relate to the same case that's all capturing all multiple numbers of cases together, or are they individual breaches? Um, 524 <laughs> relate to the one case which has been referred to twice. Uh, of course, that's public knowledge because it is um, it is uh, down for a public hearing. Um, if, if I could uh, add to that, in relation to the 540 complaints, that relates to eight cases. So the one that uh, Bill is talking about is 524 is one case, and then the remaining complaints relate to a further seven cases. Right. So, so the account, um, I mean, if 100 people complain and, and the complaint is upheld, is that 100 breaches? About, say it was about one councillor, is that counted as 100 breaches? Sorry, this, the, the, this um, <laughs> convener, if I can. Um, Sorry th this is back to the confusion which, um, which Mr Wilson referred to and, and which does bother me. Um, technically, if there's a complaint and it's found to be a breach, then and if there are two, they're found to be breaches, then that is correct. Uh, there are 524 breaches, if that is what the ultimate position is. Um, we haven't got to that point yet, of course. Um, that, or rather, actually, I'm going to contradict myself, uh, if I may be permitted to do so. <laughs> because this is the problem with the confusion. Um, it's the number of people who complaint has, who have lodged a complaint, who have an impact on the total number that we report. Uh, and I think we have to do that because it shows how many people have submitted complaints. Um, but there are, in fact, only seven councillors involved in the 524. So even supposing at the end of the process, the Standards Commission agree with me that there has been a breach, and of course they may not agree with me, um, the maximum number of breaches would be seven. 
I, I think that clar <laughs> clarifies that. Th thank you very much for that, that aspect of it. Could I just pick up on a point that the convener introduced about the alleos there? Um, as, as we all know, um, many councils are in the process of transferring assets to communities and so on, substantial, formerly substantial public assets and so on. These aren't alleos, these are, these are effectively independent groups of people that will now run and will run um, substantial facilities. Has there been any sense of a, a code of practice or guidance for those members of the public, effectively, who, who may serve in running these bodies? I'm pretty sure they won't be covered by this code, but are they covered by any code, do you think? Um, I'm not aware of any such discussions. I hope some are taking place, but I certainly have not been involved. Um, and I know that I was asked uh, before I came here to consider uh, what I might say about the Community Empowerment Bill. Um, and my rather glib answer was I didn't think it would impact very much on the work of my office. But, of course, one of the reasons for that is, as of now, uh, those community bodies to which assets might be transferred are not covered by any code which I have a, a remit to investigate. So uh, it's a fair point, and I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer. I'm fairly sure that uh, in assisting the communities to, to take ownership of some assets that there will be discussion around this area, convener, but it would be something that we might be interested in having a wee look at at some point in the future, perhaps. Um, Bill, is there any distinction drawn between, say, a councillor kind of honest forget forgetfulness about declaring something and actually acting improperly? Is there any distinction drawn between the two in terms of sanctions that can be imposed for, for failure to, to declare an interest? Um, convener, the sanctions, of course, are uh, the preserve of the Standards Commission. Um, both of those situations would, as far as I'm concerned, involve a breach of the code. Um, if I had the information to show that uh, the first councillor had um, been involved in a breach through an honest mistake, um, I would report that uh, in my report to the Standards Commission. Um, I think I would be fairly unlikely to report that I thought a councillor had done so dishonestly unless it was very blatant, uh, because I'd need to be clear that there was evidence of that. I, I'm not setting out to defame anybody uh, in a report. Um, but in both cases, um, if the Standards Commission hold a hearing uh, and they agree that there has been a breach, then they will invite the councillor or whoever is representing them uh, to make any statement they wish to make in mitigation and at that point I would expect the two different situations to come out um, and I think it is reasonable to assume, although it's not my responsibility, uh, that that might be reflected in any sanctions imposed. Okay. Lastly, uh, I mean, do, do you think there's anything we could do or the local authorities could do to further help councillors who, who will genuinely, honestly forget to declare certain things from time to time? Is there anything we can do to help mother and just to constantly remind them that they have to be aware of the code? And Do you think there's any other areas we could influence that? Um, I'm sorry, that I don't have any bright ideas. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Okay. Okay, Thank John Wilson, please. please. Thank you. Just to go back to the 524 issue, I, and just to try and drill down as to how those complaints were received, because what, what's running through my head is if you could get somebody, a uh, vexatious character, who decides to take umbrage at a particular elected member, who then goes out and get, gets all their uh, neighbours and family to sign a petition complaining against a, a councillor or an elected member, would that petition be taken as one complaint or would it, the total number of signatures and people uh, listed on that uh, petition be listed as complainants? This raises the, um, an interesting question. Um, the legislation under which I operate requires, so far as possible, or where possible, I think is the wording, um, complaints to be made in writing and to be signed by the person who complains. Um, we are trying to move to a position in which we will accept online complaints. 
which of course takes you nearer to the situation of online petitions with which people are already familiar. Um, I think it's fair to say we haven't had any as yet, uh, but we have had some complaints where effectively a standard letter has been available and it's been signed by a number of different people who've then submitted. Um, that we treat each of these as an individual complaint. But I think what I would say is that the number of people who complain about something it doesn't influence my decision as to whether I investigate or, assuming that I do investigate, doesn't influence my decision as to whether there's been a breach or not. Uh, it's the facts which matter, not the number of people complained, and not, for that matter, the motivation of the person or people who do complain. On that point, you say that you'll make a decision or decide to take forward based on the facts. Uh, now, recently, and I know that the, there was a complaint made uh, against a, a particular councillor, and I won't go into the details of the complaint made, but the facts relied on what was said at a full council meeting and allegations that were made about particular comments. Uh, now, in a situation like that, where a complaint was made, who do you rely on for the facts? Because you've got one councillor who's complained against, the other councillor makes a counterclaim. Uh, so who, who would you rely on in the for facts? Uh, for that. Mr. The short answer to that is the witnesses, but I'm sure that's not what you want to hear from me. It's what I expected you to say, but the problem is, is it goes back to your earlier point about the council monitoring officer. If the council monitoring officer is the senior legal officer of the council, and as you, I think, uh, to paraphrase what you said, is they might not want to upset anybody or be seen to be upsetting anybody, therefore they may err on the side of discretion and not provide any evidence to verify the facts, as you described it, uh, where complaints have been made against the councillors and conflicting councillors. I'm, I'm very reluctant to impute these motives to uh, any monitoring officer who is a witness to something which has become a complaint. Um, but I, I think what I come back to is the standard of proof, um, which I have to observe, uh, and which is relevant in any public hearing, is on a balance of probabilities. Um, if the only available information is Councillor A saying that Councillor B said something, and Councillor B denying that he said something, if there's no other information on a balance of probabilities, I can't make a decision that Councillor B did say anything. Modern technology may help in that regard. Those councils that are now webcasting and things like that, have, uh, have you taken that into account to, yes. during the investigation? Absolutely. Um, and sometimes we're given a transcript. Um, even where there isn't uh, a webcast available, some, some proceedings are actually recorded. Um, sometimes the transcripts Not verbatim. Well, no, well, it's not the quality of the official report. Spare Janice. And it's blushes, but uh, no, <laughs> certainly not that quality. <laughs> now she is blushing. Uh, John? Convener, it's just that, that that's part of the issue in terms, and it's not just Councillor A versus Councillor B, it's when it's said in a public forum, such as a full council meeting or a committee meeting, where there isn't a verbatim uh, record of what's said, and we rely on other witnesses, and the other witnesses that, you know, is trying to as you said, get the facts of the case to make sure that you're actually dealing with the facts rather than a group of potentially elected members uh, deciding to make a case against another, another elected member of a different political persuasion or none uh, to then say, oh, we're, we're registering a complaint against this councillor because he said something derogatory or she said something derogatory against the particular member or against the council. And it's then how you how you deal with those facts and how you deal with the, that case and those circumstances. I, I have no argument at all with what you're saying. I mean, that is one of the challenges of my job. Um, and I do my best to exercise my judgment. Um, I'm not claiming I will always get it right, but I, uh, I can only do so impartially and to the best of my ability. But as technology moves on, your job may be a little bit easier. <laughs> I, I always remember a case long before the days of the Standards Commission, it has to be said, of a story of a North East councillor where one councillor accused uh, another of calling him a baboon 
uh, and the other councillor stood up and said, for the record, I call them a buffoon, not a baboon. I would never insult baboons in that manner. Um, now, in those days, there, I understand there was a, a verbatim record, but no standards commission. Uh, now we have no verbatim records per se, but a standards commission. But webcasts, radio broadcasts may be helpful in that regard in future. Convener, the other thing they are helpful with, and it is terribly important, is the context in which remarks are made. Indeed. And that judgment must be difficult at certain points for you too. Indeed. Um, Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, in view of what you said earlier, are you concerned about the amount there are very few anonymous complaints? Are you? How do you judge if they're anonymous? I wasn't quite sure what you were saying that there's hardly any but come up, but I mean the anonymous that seems to defy the whole system in a way. Some people are unwilling to put their name to a complaint, um, and those are quite simply anonymous. Um, and you will appreciate there is no way in which we can get in touch with the person who submitted a complaint if they don't disclose their identity. So they are, they have to remain anonymous as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and I, I, well, there would have to be exceptional circumstances for me to progress a complaint of that nature. So the answer is you tend not to progress the anonymous complaints? That's the rule, <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, so Claire clarify. Adamson, please. It, it was really a supplementary on the t technology issue. Um, obviously, um, Different councils have adopted different policies with regards to this at the moment, but is this something that you can have any influence over? And would you suggest that best practice should be that um, full council meetings, for instance, would be recorded in a webcast of some kind? I, I, I really don't think that's for me to say. I, I think it's a matter for councils. Uh, by the way, uh, we've even had YouTube uh, video uh, evidence used. so. There's all sorts of technology which may or may not be relevant to particular circumstances. Thank you. If we could stick to the technology aspect, because many, many more folk are now using social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, lots of other things which I don't understand at all. Um, and we have seen circumstances where um, I, I think complaints have been made about individual councillors, about comments that they have made. Um, to uh, constituents on social media. Um, and I, I suppose you have the difficulty um, in some regards of whether uh, somebody is insulting someone in a, uh, a, an official capacity, like my, my last story, or, uh, or, or in a, uh, as an individual. Um, and can I ask, in terms of the social media stuff, where there have been breaches or, or, or found not to be breaches because somebody is acting in a personal capacity, how difficult is it for you to make judgments in these regards? Uh, some are very clear, some are very unclear. So, yes, in some cases it is, it is very difficult. Um, and I think it's an area where, at the very least, further guidance um, would be helpful. I have discussed it with the Standards Commission. Um, I know they're aware of it being a developing problem area. Um, I think Helen has a number of cases. I think we've got roughly 20 in the course of this year. 20 complaints. Oh, yeah. Yes, we've had uh, 20 complaints received this year in relation to social media. And how many of those have been deemed to be breaches thus far and how many are still under investigation? We have not received, we've not concluded a breach in that area. And I couldn't give you the exact figures of how many were under consideration. I just have the number that have been received. I can certainly provide that for you if that's of interest to the committee. I think that would be extremely useful, and I think it would be extremely useful for us to be uh, kept up to speed uh, with what the policy decision of the Commission is going to be round about um, dealing with, with social media. Um, I recognise that there's a certain rough and tumble um, that goes on, but, you know, uh, as a casual observer of Twitter... I have to say that sometimes uh, I feel that uh, some of the stuff that is happening on there is a little bit beyond the pale. I really couldn't say anything Obviously other Obviously you couldn't. Um, I would also mention that Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights um, may well have an impact in some of these cases or may be relevant to some of these complaints. 
For the record, could you tell us what Article 10 is, Mr Thompson? Um, in effect, Article 10 uh, defends the right of freedom of speech. Um, and as I understand it, it is interpreted more liberally in the context of political debate uh, and, for that matter, reporting through the media uh, than it would be uh, as between any of us who just happen to have a discussion outside this room uh, on a private basis. Um, quite offensive comments have been held by the courts to be protected under Article 10 of the European Convention. Thank you. Uh, I think, as I say, it would be very interesting for us to be kept up to speed with uh, what decisions are, are made uh, around about that. Um, certainly in, in terms of, uh, as I say, some of the things that I've seen and some of the uh, comments that have been made to me by, by members of the public, uh, I think that is a matter of, of concern for some people. Um, if I could go back to a, a previous discussion that we've had around about community empowerment, um, where participation requests, um, asset transfers, I think uh, may create uh, some uh, tensions, particularly in the initial stages as these bed in. Um, are, you, are you prepared um, to deal uh, with any spike in complaints regarding that when it comes into play? Depends what you mean by prepared, convener. Um, <laughs> I'm not expecting a spike for the reasons I uh, gave before in that I'm not convinced that there will be, at least in the short term, a relevant code of conduct under which complaints could be made to me. Um, but I'm hoping there will not be a further spike for any reason. Um, it's quite uncomfortable to deal with, frankly. OK. John? Just, to, just on that, the, the spikes, I, I know the figures you gave us from were comparative figures were 2011-12. Uh, my understanding is there was a number of complaints just before the 2012 election uh, and local government election. Uh, so you're not expecting a spike just prior to 2017 in relation to complaints coming forward. Uh, particularly given uh, the public hi uh, highlighting the, the case in Aberdeen where the number of complaints that have been made about misuse of council resources uh, could be replicated in other authorities uh, and uh, either against the incumbent uh, majority or against individual councillors. Mr Thompson. Um, uh, I have not been worrying unduly about the period before 2017, um, just simply because it's uh, a little bit um, further away. Um, I think most of us would expect that at times of heightened political awareness, or for that matter, heightened political tension, um, it is more likely that there, that, that would generate uh, complaints, certainly politically motivated complaints, um, what has surprised me is that the level of complaints coming in doesn't seem to correspond directly with periods, um, say the period before um, successive elections, um, which suggests to me that actually the majority do come from the public for whatever reason they're motivated to do so. Um, and that is a more important factor uh, in terms of the total number of complaints which we receive. Do you think that maybe elected members have stopped coming to you about other elected members because so many of the cases in the past have been dismissed uh, and have been deemed to be political? I need to be careful how I answer that. I have not dismissed any complaints on the grounds that they were political. Um, I don't know why uh, councillors have... The numbers that have come in from councillors have reduced. I'm, I'm happy to see that the number has gone down, but I, I can't tell you why. Uh, but you would say that uh, a complaint from a councillor um, would have the same uh, uh, effect as a, a complaint from a member of the public? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions? 
Is there anything that you would like to add, Mr. Thompson? No, thank you. Um, I think we would be grateful if we could get updates on, on certain aspects of this, particularly um, as things progress round about social media, uh, because there does seem to be a, a certain amount of interest uh, in that area. Can I thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr Thompson, Mrs Hayne, for your evidence today, uh, and I suspend and we move into private session. Thank you.